Hello, and welcome back to the third installment of my Demon Souls Compare Through. In this series, we'll continue to explore the game with a fine-toothed comb and examine how things were changed for the PlayStation 5 remake. And we're also going to use this as an excuse to talk about all of the weird and obscure stuff we can find along the way. I realize it's been a long time since the last episode, something I promised wouldn't take so long, and we all know how that turned out. I'll talk more about the future of this series going forward at the end of the video, but for now I'll say that there is a silver lining in having waited this long. Breakthroughs have been made in data mining the remake, which allows us to uncover more of its secrets in much greater detail. Here's an example. We previously left off after having cleared the first half of Bulletaria, and something I mentioned in that episode was how the developers talked about improving the drop rate of fire consumables to help with the phalanx. We very slightly changed some of the pickup drop rates right before phalanx, for example, to make it easier because we realized from looking at trophy stats that a lot of people stopped playing the game before ever beating phalanx. But let's do a deeper dive real quick here, something we weren't able to do previously. How this worked in the original game is that some enemies had a chance to drop firebombs, while others had a chance to drop turpentine. But none of these enemies had the chance to drop both, and the drop rate was only slightly better than 5% at base world tendency and luck. What the remake did is it added a new drop event where the drop chance is essentially 1 in 3 by default, and both of these items are now carried by a single enemy. The base values that are set give it a 30% chance for nothing, a 35% chance for a firebomb, and a 35% chance for pine resin. The way drop rates are calculated makes it come out to not be exactly that, but that's close enough. This might not sound like a subtle change, as 5% to over 30% sounds like a huge increase, but they only gave this to a couple specific enemies. This is for the Dreglings outside of the Phalanx boss room, who now have flame swords who didn't previously have them. The rest of the Dreglings and soldiers, who sometimes drop firebombs or turpentine, didn't have any of their drop rates altered. So this means that they significantly increase the drop rate for the fire consumables, but only for two enemies that you might encounter on your way to the boss, which I think is a pretty good way of balancing that. We've also got some hard numbers now for the Hoplite Shield. The Hoplite Shield is a completely new item that didn't exist in the original. It can be unlocked from the start with the purchase of the Digital Deluxe Edition, but thankfully they at least included this as a possible drop as well. It is very rare though, with a default drop rate of 0.5%. This means it's roughly twice as rare as the rarest weapons from Dark Souls 1. Weapons like the Channeler's Trident and Ghostblade had a 1% drop chance. Again, with the way things are calculated, this is closer to 0.55% with 7 luck, the lowest luck of any starting class. Increasing your luck will improve its drop rate. This isn't one of those cases where luck winds up being detrimental. At 50 luck, its drop rate is roughly 1.4% instead. And going against the common wisdom of darkening your world tendency to improve drop rates, that won't actually help at all with the Hoplite Shield. There is no global impact on drop rates from world tendency. While it often helps, that's something that has to be set for every individual drop, and they chose to not do that here. Okay, that catches us up on things I would have liked to have included in the previous episode if we had the advancements in data mining that have been made since. But for today's episode, the main focus is Stonefang Tunnel. The flavor text for Stonefang between the two versions more or less says the same thing. Stonefang is a lost city of miners whose work supported the soldiers of Bulataria, but now they're soul-starved and mindless. The one difference of potential relevance here is how the remake stresses long ago, while the original English text didn't hint at how much time has passed here. The ambiguous passage of time in both versions allows for some flexibility here, though it's been brought to my attention that the original Japanese text in other parts of the game strongly implies that at least several years have passed since things have started falling apart. This small distinction isn't going to be too relevant to what we find in Stonefang, but it shows where Bluepoint came out on the timeline of the decay of everything. People might not have liked the stylistic change for this overgrown hallway in Bulataria, but there is some internal consistency with how Bluepoint interpreted things, and it's not as dissonant as you might think with the original game's lore. I've always wondered what this monument is exactly, and I don't think there are any concrete answers. On one hand, it looks like it could be a tombstone of some kind, but its placement under this bridge is maybe a bit odd for that, and there's nothing in the lore that suggests anyone important died here. 
We don't know how far Stonefang is from the castle in Boletaria, but as I just mentioned a moment ago, the mining operations are stated to have been in support of the kingdom. So in my personal headcanon, this is more likely to be a monument to the mining operation itself. Humor me while I try to come up with an in-universe explanation for what might just be a video gamey detail. We can assume we're pretty far from the castle given how different the landscape is. It would have taken a ton of work to have built all the infrastructure needed to transport stuff back and forth. So I think this bridge was probably the last major thing that needed to be constructed for their roadways. It's the final stretch into the mines. This is exactly the sort of thing that gets commemorated in real life. Sometimes mines also have memorials erected to honor the people who've died in them, going back to the tombstone idea. But Boletaria had slaves. The Dreglings are canonically slaves, and while it's unclear where the Stonefang miners wind up on the slave-to-exploited worker spectrum, the game says in multiple ways that lower-class people were not treated well. There is also reason to believe that the miners have descended from a more ancient civilization, so I doubt the Boletarians moving in to take advantage of their resources would have any interest in paying tribute to them. If anything is being celebrated here, it's Boletaria's expansion as a kingdom. And since that's the very first thing we see here, being greeted by that sort of monument falling apart would nicely set the tone for the area. One key difference is found immediately to our right, where there's now an opening in the wall that reveals an abandoned attempt at an alternate entrance into the mines. Taking a closer look inside, we can see a pickaxe that got left behind. This is yet again one of many examples of Bluepoint adding details into the environment that didn't affect the size or walkable space of the map, by adding these sort of window spaces. I'd like to think this is a more recent attempt at breaking in. The mines being a place of value isn't exactly a secret, and it's implied that a bunch of people would be coming here for this purpose. Having a shortcut into the mines, right next to the archstone, that lets you skip all of this, that certainly would have been helpful. Does this make any sense as a perspective shortcut, though? And yeah, it really does. If they had burrowed just a few feet further, they would have popped out right over here. It takes you right to the interior drop-down area of 2-2. Here's a look in Dark Souls Map Studio. Though as nicely as this happens to work out, there's also a good reason to not take the map space too literally here. Stonefang is perhaps the least spatially consistent map of Demon Souls, and we'll take a closer look at that in a moment. As we head up the stairs here, we find that, once again, the objects in the environment are mostly identical to the original, with only very minor variations. The Filthy Man's personal collection of stuff is a bit different. This corner here is mostly the same, with some rubble added in. Over here, it appears that they didn't recreate the asset for this canvas-looking container, so they replaced this one with a wooden bucket, and this one with a rope on the ground. And they put some stuff in this cart when it used to be empty. Something to note about the horse corpses is that they've had ragdoll physics added to their head and legs, but the torso remains completely fixed. Something worth pointing out over here is that this crystal lizard had an issue with running off and falling to its death, taking its precious resources with it. It wasn't a guaranteed outcome, you could go straight after it and approach from an angle where that's less likely to happen, but the problem was that doing something like going to interact with the filthy man or heading towards this elevator usually did put it on a course to die. The remake was generous and fixed this by putting what appears to be an invisible barrier for enemies here. Or at least, when the Crystal Lizard reaches this spot, it'll do its disappearing animation instead. This wasn't the only change to make things a little more forgiving with Crystal Lizards, but I'll cover that in more detail in the next area. As we approach the cliff's edge here, the camera in the remake pulls back a little bit. I'm not entirely sure if this is just for aesthetic reasons, or if it's also a safety feature of sorts. The camera pulling back can help communicate that it's a dead end. And like we saw in the previous episode, item corpses continue to be placed and posed pretty much identically, though the classes have been jumbled and we now have a knight here instead of a priest. And the real key difference here is the vista. The nearby mountains are pushed much further back, and we lose these nearby ruins. I always liked this structure for whatever reason, so I do miss it a little bit. Instead, we have this rock pillar formation with a bunch of cranes scattered around the environment. I think it's kind of funny to have one placed nearby over here as an explanation for what's helping keep this wagon from falling over the cliff's edge. Does this mean that someone was in the process of lifting it out of there, but then stopped halfway through? 
It's like trying to make more sense of it somehow makes less sense. Beyond the Wagon is what I'd interpret to be the road leading back to Boletaria. In the remake, it heads more or less straight back through some arches. In the original, it's more difficult to make sense of the nearby low-poly terrain, but this flat part you see here is intended to be the road. If we go out of bounds, we can follow the path behind the wagon, and we find that it quickly snakes back around in this direction, and heads down this valley. Where would this road have led? To the front gates of Boletaria? Or perhaps into the town seen in 1-2? Of course, the world of Demon Souls wasn't designed with any of these specifics in mind, but by putting in a few random paths we can't access, it allows us to connect the dots in our head. One positive to removing the mountain with this structure is that it opens up our view to the nearby town from the top of the steps. Normally, we'd have to cross the bridge to see this better. I always find these distant, inaccessible towns fun to look at. Of course, the town itself was heavily redesigned, which is not much of a surprise. The original had a river running through, which is nowhere to be seen in the remake. Something the remake has instead is a bunch of minecart tracks below. The distant ground is also generally dropped quite a bit lower, a subtle but recurring design change for the remake that might be for two reasons. It helps make the surrounding environment feel bigger in scale. But also, if your nearby out-of-bounds areas are closer to the player, that puts more pressure on the developers to cram in more detail so it's not so obviously barren. Though, I also wonder if putting the town on top of this higher plateau was inspired by the actual level layout in any way. If we look at the map viewer, we can see how the Dragon God's Arena in 2-3 clips through the terrain. The top of the ceiling down here would extend pretty high above the ground. If you didn't quite follow those visuals, since it can be messy with the maps overlapping, here I dropped some item bags way up in the air at the far end of the Dragon God's Arena, and we can see how they're floating above the far end of the town when we go back to the beginning. This is one of a handful of things that tells us that we shouldn't take the spatial accuracy of Stonefang 2 literally, and that we should just imagine that we travel lower than we actually do. I'm not saying the remake adequately houses the Dragon God's Arena, or that it's positioned accurately below this town, either. But if you had to compare these two designs and ask which town looks like it's built above a giant hidden chamber, we can give the remake a few points for this. Of course, it could all just be a coincidence, and it's entirely possible that this wasn't done for that reason but I do think some of this stuff was changed with the level design in mind. Revisiting the abandoned shortcut here, I wouldn't be surprised if where it dropped you off in 2-2 was surprising to a lot of viewers. The second level of Stonefang should be lower than the first one, right? After all, we take a pretty long elevator ride to get down to the Armor Spider, so I think this is what most players would expect on a gut level. But you have to remember that we actually travel upwards quite a bit to get to that elevator in the first place. This means the entrance to 2-2 really isn't any lower than the beginning of Stonefang, so the maps wind up overlapping. If we drop some items in this room here, and then make our way to the room after the Armored Spider, we'll see them floating in the air. Because that's where the floor of that previous room really is, in relation to here. You can do the same trick in the remake. They didn't implement anything to prevent that from happening. We can also recognize that the maps are overlapping using photo mode as we can normally extend the camera pretty far above ourselves when we're in an open area. But here we can't lift it very high, because it collides with the other room. Okay, so what does any of this have to do with the intentionality of changing the vista back over here? Looking beyond the outdoor elevator platform, we can see that more terrain was added behind and to the right of the main building. This is where I'm a little more hesitant to chalk this up as a coincidence. Because of the overlapping maps, we have this platform in 2-2 at the top of that outside area with the drop-down paths, and this would be visible from the first level if everything was rendered together. Dropping some items towards the end of this platform allows us to see them floating in the air if we walk all the way back to the beginning. Now, I doubt that Bluepoint cared about people dropping item bags or bloodstains in obscure ways and then carefully hunting for the sight of them from a distance, but if we're to believe that that section of 2-2 should be somewhere around this corner, Putting more terrain to obscure our view here in the remake makes it feel a little more plausible that it's hiding around the corner. Just a couple more observations while we're out here, but if we take a closer look at the distant town in the original, we'll find that it recycles some assets from the unused town of the tutorial prototype. That's something I showed in the first episode, but I'll link to a timestamp for that below if you'd like another look. So while I marveled that it was pretty wild for them to go through the effort of making an entire distant view for something that wound up being cut from the tutorial, Things are reused and rearranged out here, so it didn't go to waste. This is yet something else that gives Stonefang some weird connective tissue with the tutorial. 
The first obvious connection is that the Dragon God is used in both locations, but now we also have the prototype town making a comeback. Even the river running past the town forks in the distance just like it did in the prototype tutorial. But they covered it with this weird bit of landmass here. It was done in a very obvious and kind of patchy way if you look at it closely. It's almost like they were covering their tracks to differentiate it from how it was in the tutorial. And maybe this last one is a stretch, but the tutorial also scrapped a few locations where stones would fall on top of you. That might have been reconceptualized for Stonefang as well. Despite being the second Archstone, Stonefang has the highest map number out of all of the regular areas. It's map number 6. I think it's likely that Stonefang might have been one of the last major Archstones to be developed. And by this point, they were probably looking to recycle some cut content from the tutorial that wasn't used in the main game yet. And one last observation while we're out here. Some of the distant minecart tracks below have a way of disappearing from view when we look directly at them, only becoming visible when they're on the periphery. This happens from a few different vantage points, and I'm not sure of the exact reason for this. I like this proposed explanation from Dash Retro TV on Twitter, where it's probably a draw distance issue affected by the angle of the camera. But if you have your own thoughts on what's happening here, please leave a comment below. We'll talk to the filthy man when we open the shortcut. For now, let's continue on. The messages on this bridge had their wording changed slightly, but there's no significant difference. At times, Demon Souls leans a lot harder into the damage type being a lot more important compared to other Souls games, and you'll find that here with the Miners. Though they actually did slightly debuff how effective magic is against the Miners, and I'm not sure if that was the correct choice. With the exact same stats, we can see here how Soul Arrow now does less damage. It was only a slight debuff, and this isn't a change unique to the Miners. Most enemies in the remake had magic and fire defense increased a little bit. In most cases, I think this was perfectly justified. Because the changes are fairly minor, things were not really nerfed for the player to the point of discouraging a previously viable playstyle. They just wanted to take the edge off of magic and fire damage. But when magic is proposed as one of the two things that is supposed to work against the miners, I don't know that being a little overpowered for them was ever an issue. Here we encounter a change to one of the game's bullet parameters. Bullet prams are the values that typically affect projectiles, and there weren't actually very many changes here for the remake, so it's interesting when it happens. They made it easier to run past the boulders here by shaving a half second off of its lingering AoE when it hits the ground. They also made it so that the projectile's hit radius grows to full size faster as it's being thrown. Though I'm not sure how much this part really matters, no one's getting hit by it midair. While some purists might complain about any instances of making the game easier, I think this is about as close as it gets to a change being objectively for the better. When I started preparing for this episode, but before I knew about these data mined values, I found myself accidentally running into the boulders a couple times in the PlayStation 3 version, when I didn't have that same problem on PS5. Without understanding that there was actually a concrete difference between the two versions at first, I had a gut feeling that something was just kind of wrong here. Even though I chalked it up to just being unlucky at first, it felt a bit cheap that I took a hit when it felt like I shouldn't have. The developers at Bluepoint seemed to agree, and I'm sure most players would as well if you have the opportunity to directly compare both versions. It just wasn't very good originally. Something else that got fixed here was a shortcoming with the draw groups. From down here in the original, the room behind the Rock 3 Miners isn't rendered. While it's unsurprising that this was fixed in the remake, we actually will encounter a few places where the remake doesn't correct everything like this. Everything out here is almost exactly the same, though they did move this one box out of the way. And most of the objects on the set of shelves are the same, but they did remove the pillow-shaped sacks here. These sacks also went missing over by the filthy man, so for whatever reason, this is one particular asset that doesn't seem to have made it over. I miss those filthy man sacks. This iron gate with a curved path behind it remains, but they added a couple barrels in front of it and inside. And they also seem to have tucked a coffin inside here in the remake. It's kind of a weird place for a coffin. They also moved and reduced the size of this rubble pile, so it's not as easy to get awkwardly stuck in this corner. It's not that hard to get yourself back out of there in the original, but you can see why they changed it. The outside of the building had some minor changes to add more detail. Specifically, instead of one tall, flat wall, we're going to find something like a second floor that is recessed a bit to add a new exterior walkway. Tattered tapestries also now hang above the main entrance. When we go up the elevator outside, we'll also find this sort of attic space that wasn't here originally. I 
As we make our way indoors, we're going to find an environment where Bluepoint does a much better job of remaining faithful to the original than we've seen so far. When they don't overdo it with stylistic changes, they can be really, really good at this. If you didn't like the changes to the outdoor vistas, I've got good news about most of the rest of the level. It looks pretty great. I feel this way about most of Stonefang and the Shrine of Storms, so it's nice to not have as much to nitpick and just enjoy how the environment looks. Some of the nearby space in the remake was actually decluttered, slightly. Some of the objects in the original that required attacking or rolling into to break just crumble by walking into them now. I think they did a good job of picking and choosing which objects this happens to. Perhaps the most important visual difference in this room is the added torches around the mechanism that operates the elevator. The original didn't exactly need it, but the increased detail brings a bit of visual noise, so it was wise to add something that pulls your eyes towards it. And though I just talked about not having to worry about nitpicking the environment as much, I can't say the same for the creature redesigns. I'm trying to keep a fairly neutral tone for this series overall, because I really do want to have a balanced approach where I can still find and highlight some of the strengths that Bluepoint brought to the table. Not every change is bad, and there are some that I like. But if you're someone with a very critical outlook on how Bluepoint handled the source material, you might be relieved to hear me agree with you here, and I'm not going to sugarcoat this. Some of these changes are awful. Let's start with the miners. They come out looking more brutish in the remake, and I don't necessarily have an issue with all of these changes. Uh, they were a lot scrawnier in the original, so to give them thicker arms and a much thicker neck and broader back helps sell the idea that they're just mining away constantly. Their idling animations for mining have also been improved, where in the original their strikes didn't appear to have much of an impact. A few remaining strands of hair on the top of the head were traded for much more prominent, longer white hairs that dangle from the base of their scalp. These are fairly rigid and don't always dangle towards the floor, so it doesn't look great while they're digging around. Something that could have been avoided if they conveyed their balding the same way the original did. But the obvious change here is what's most problematic to me. What happened to their scales? If you look really closely, you can find some spots where the skin appears to be hardened, but it's not nearly enough. The miners are becoming more serpentine. serpentine, serpentine. Never straight line, serpentine. The exact cause of this is unknown, but I'd like to believe that the growing influence of the Dragon God is rubbing off on the people who've been here the longest. From Software does like the reoccurring theme of dragons being able to turn people into dragon-humanoid hybrids, after all. There are some bits of this reptilian transformation remaining in the remake, but the effect is greatly diminished, to the point that it feels like they didn't understand this aspect of their design. Sure, they still have that distinctive, forked tongue, but now that feels more like a random detail without their scales to back it up. The change to their eyes is also a part of this problem. The original model had a vertical slit, while in the remake they now have round pupils instead. To try and give Bluepoint some credit, I ran into a document that highlighted round pupils with cataracts as something that's fairly common for snakes. So not only can they have round pupils, but the miners also have a foggy look to their eyes, so maybe someone did their research and this was the kind of snake eye they decided to put into the game. But you know what else has round pupils? Humans. Just because snakes can and frequently do have round pupils, they also have another type of eye that's distinctly not human. And that's the one they decided to get rid of for the remake. Their eyes are even referenced in the dialogue of the filthy man, so it's odd to lessen that impact of their design. All those lizard-eyed townsfolk are busy tinkering with stone. It's one thing to have the tone or style of something change in the pursuit of adding more details for higher graphical fidelity, but that's not what went wrong here. The miners come out looking more simplistic in the remake, in a way that impedes on the environmental storytelling concept art for the remake does show the scales on their skin, and in fact I'd say the lower half of their body looks like it's pretty far along in that transformation. But this just wasn't translated over to the model properly. Going up the elevator, we also encounter our first fat official up close. This is up there as easily one of the worst design decisions for the remake. It feels almost disrespectful to the source material. Now I do understand that with the low quality resolution and lower poly models of the PlayStation 3, it wasn't entirely clear what was going on with the fat official's face. Is it a mask? Or is the demonic influence just making their face actually look that way? Upon closer inspection, you can't find anything that would mark the boundary of a mask, so I do think this is just their face at this point. But the end result is still the same. You have this wide, unrelenting grin that can be mistaken for a mask, this glossy purple texture for the skin, and eyes that aren't really there anymore. It looks incredibly unhuman. Then the remake just did this instead. It's hard to know where to begin. 
The massive grin is missing, and I'm not sure why you'd change that, because that was pretty obviously a defining characteristic of theirs. The weird purplish skin is gone, and there's no gray area on whether it's a mask or not, which completely drains all of the mystique they previously had. They seem to have wanted to go for a gross-out sort of thing, which is just in poor taste. I also don't like how the belly is now exposed. Gluttony and cruelty are themes inherent to their design, from the unbuttoned shirt that doesn't quite fit them anymore, to the array of torture devices hanging from their belt. The original did just fine with this, but now the remake is like, hey look at these gross growths on this guy's belly. It's completely unnecessary, and if anything it humanizes them a bit by showing bad things happen to them. One thing I should add, that is usually missing from this discussion, is that we do have an answer as to where the large boils or growths on their skin come from, and it does source back to an idea that From Software originally had. Bluepoint didn't just completely pull this out of the blue point. Concept art for Dark Souls included a fat official riding a boar. You heard correctly, Dark Souls, not Demon Souls, and we find this on their face there. But even in this concept art, we still have that large grin and a natural skin tone. So the mark was missed if they were going for this instead. And I don't know that striving for their appearance from a scrapped Dark Souls 1 version was the right choice. If they found this alternate design fascinating like I do, and wanted to reference it, I think the best way to handle it would have been to make just one of the fat officials look like this. Perhaps put one in the area with the penetrator armor in Boletaria. So by that point it's an easter egg, and it would introduce a bit of mystery when players wonder why it looks different. If this was a bizarre one-off, and not how all of them looked, I don't think anyone would be complaining. If you'd like to hear someone go off on this a bit more, I'll link to a timestamp in a recent video by Ratatasker. Not only because it includes a great review of the thematic failures of this redesign, but I also have to admit that I watched that video a few weeks ago, and I'm honestly not entirely sure to what extent it colored what I had to say here. Part of me is pretty certain I would have said all of the exact same things, and that we arrived at the same conclusions independently, but a shoutout is certainly in order. If we go down below with Dark Enough World Tendency, we'll encounter our first primeval demon. There's one of these in every world, when you hit negative 150 world tendency or lower, but this is the only one in any world found before the first boss. I think you know where I'm going with this, I'm not really a fan of this redesign either. Yeah, the original is pretty gross too, I guess, especially with whatever's going on over here, but the rest of the body is this fairly simple cylinder shape. The remake makes it a lot more bulbous, with a much more fleshy skin tone. If you compare how the weird tendril hair things stick out, that just looks pretty gross in a way that it wasn't before. And they changed his face to have a much more menacing mandible. And it also loses the striking contrast that the original had, where that had silver skin reaching down to its face, which opened up into an orifice surrounded by pink skin. Whereas in the remake, it's all basically just the same color. I like the idea that it's this otherworldly creature that shows up as you continue to lose grip on your human form, and it seems pretty indifferent to your existence. It does attack you if you get close enough, but it's a really basic attack and it doesn't pursue you at all. It's really just defending itself, and pretty lazily at that. Changing it to appear more hostile and ugly than before doesn't seem necessary, when weird and strange was already good enough. The original concept art of it already looked really cool, so what does the remake bring to the table beyond just making it a little more repulsive? I'm not sure. The new concept art shows that the artist was trying to incorporate a variety of influences from various animals. The artist is certainly very talented, but why was anyone tasked with this assignment in the first place? What was the impetus to make it look more like the brain bug from Starship Troopers, instead of using the really cool and unique design they already had? The original concept art also includes one specific design element that's kind of interesting. It has goopy black stuff all over the end of its tail. This was in the original game, and enhancing that for the remake so that it maybe tripped or splashed around could have been pretty cool. But not only did they not do that, they just got rid of that entirely. This is not just another less is more situation. Details from the original are missing. I can't help but feel that this is another downgrade. One positive, mechanical change for the remake is that the primeval demons have had their drop table updated to now guarantee a colorless demon soul. You'd be forgiven for not realizing that this wasn't already the case in the original, where that just had a 90.8% chance of dropping instead. So there was almost a 10% chance of getting nothing in the original, which doesn't seem like a fair outcome for a non-responding enemy, where you could reasonably assume that it should drop the item for you. We can also give credit to the remake for fixing a draw group issue, where the primeval demon failed to render from this chunk of terrain by the beginning of the level. So there are some technical improvements worth mentioning. It's just a shame how they handled the art direction. Let's continue on.
Moving the camera down here in photo mode reveals a bit of terrain that isn't textured properly. I'm only pointing this out because it's kind of remarkable how rare this is. I've spent a lot of time messing around in photo mode, and I haven't found much like this. I like what they did with this room here. There aren't any major changes, but there are additional light sources higher up and further back. Providing a backlight on this minecart mechanism brings it into view better. And additional light shafts poking through the cavernous ceiling above help us understand the space we're in a bit better. The overall visual aesthetic of the remake here is very pleasing in its own way. Quick comparison of the dogs here, but I don't have any major complaints. They inverted the shape of the blades attached to their muzzle, so the sharp part of the blade isn't pointing inwards, which I suppose makes a bit more sense now. As much as attaching blades to a dog's face can make any sense in the first place. One detail that might have been lost is that the original appeared to have something like a cataract in one of its eyes. Though we can see it pretty easily in the model viewer here, I can assure you this detail basically disappears outside of it. Even when pausing the game and taking a close look with an upscaled resolution, we can get a much clearer look than anyone was ever able to get on PS3 back in the day, and that detail is damn near impossible to see. It's just not a characteristic of the dog's design that anyone has in mind, so if it is completely missing from the remake, it's not a big deal to me. Really, the only relevant design change in my opinion is that their fur is a brighter white than the darker color they had previously, which is fine. This fat official has an idling animation where he appears to chew his fingernails. I like some of the added idling animations for certain enemies, but this just sort of adds to their botched vibe. The one above has an animation that I think is fine though. It's like he's watching over and giving orders to the miners below. The fat official's room on the ground level adds some objects to this table. But again, we find that most objects remain identical in their placement. The horse in this corner has its head clipping into the ground in the remake, but I doubt many people have noticed. In this hallway leading to the rooftop, we have this side room containing the corpse with the pickaxe. Here we find an example of where the draw groups appear to be handled in the same way across both versions, as when we reach the end of the hall, the corpse carrying the item disappears. This is more noticeable in the remake, due to the more significant glow of the item, and there also might be a different depth of field impacting our view. I'm not totally sure, but for whatever reason, this is nearly impossible to see in the original, but Freecam helps confirm that this behavior is identical. Here's something else that's kind of funny. If you progress backwards through this level from another entrance, you can watch the attack animations of the miners get triggered at the wrong time, because apparently the game is just looking for us entering this area at all. This is also completely unchanged for the remake. Attack animations like this aren't a normal part of the enemy's combat AI. If that were the case, it might try walking up to you when it sees you, which would ruin it. So instead, they script these little events to customize these sorts of traps. This is easy to demonstrate in Dark Souls Debug. Under Character Instructions, we can toggle options called All No Attack and All No Move. These being turned on will of course make enemies just stand around. But even though they're instructed to not move, we're still going to see things like ghosts popping up out of the ground, and we'll even find some that still attack in special situations, because these are special environment-based triggers. And this trigger just happens to be unnecessarily large, not accounting for a typical level progression. Heading up on top of this building here, we can look out towards this out-of-bounds view and find some more significant changes. The original had some distant buildings that were barely visible, while well, the remake gets rid of them, but has more minecart mechanisms and tracks. There's an unintended speedrun skip here that can get you down to 2-2 pretty quickly. I'll link to some videos instead of showing the whole process, but in the original it involved rolling off of this ledge to get out of bounds, and then proceeding forward and falling out of the map can land you in 2-2. This is still possible in the remake, though the execution has changed a little bit. The most interesting change to me is how they added an invisible wall that prevents you from getting out of bounds in the same way. However, you can now roll and land on top of that invisible wall and walk up it. But I'm less interested in skipping for the sake of speedrunning. I just like to try to find the seams of the maps and get a closer look at things out of bounds. We can get a closer look at how one of the minecart tracks dead ends shortly out of view. We can also see how one of these torch sconces is floating midair out here. We can just barely see it from inbounds, so it is a small visual mistake we can spot. But I doubt anyone's noticed that without going out of bounds first. 
Something that might happen if you botch the speedrun drop to 2-2 is you can fall out of the map in such a way that it gives you a really good look at the remake's skybox. There's something oddly satisfying to me about getting a closer look at asset speed for the PS5 version that we're not ever meant to see clearly. We can see how this looks compared to the PS3 skybox. Let's continue on to the other half of this room. Here's a subtle change for the remake. This breakaway platform was altered so that it falls apart in two separate sections. Whereas in the original, it's just one piece that breaks away. Looking up from here, in the distance we can see a wooden structure in the remake, while that same area in the original is barren. This is where the wooden walkway should be that leads up to the elevator before the boss. So the remake made the right move to show it to us from down here. It should be there in the original too, it's just not rendered from here. I've dropped some item bags on that walkway in the original, and then went back down to where we just were, to see what that looks like. And there's a spot later in the level where we can see the same walkway pop in and out of existence. So rendering it from further away in the remake fixes this issue for more than one vantage point. This is one of those offline ghosts I talked about in the first video. It's not another player, it's guaranteed to be here to help direct our attention to the lever. You might think that they changed the appearance or loadout of this ghost, but the interesting part is that they actually didn't. Not really. The earlier Souls games were pretty aggressive in simplifying player ghosts. You wouldn't see the actual armor or necessarily even the weapons that players had equipped. This is something else we can use Dark Souls 1 to demonstrate clearly. Here I'm using Debug to see why I'm Ghost, and we can see how my Ghost changes from appearing naked to then showing armor. This is something they did intentionally for Ghosts that get near bonfires. So the difference we see between the two versions of Demon Souls here is explained by this entirely. They just made it so that Ghosts in the remake show more detail. Here I'll change his character type in the original, and the mirrored and armor set we see in the remake suddenly appears. Something I recently discovered is that there's an unused path found over here out of bounds. I noticed that it was a bit odd for them to actually construct an opening for these carts to pass through. Most games would probably just have them clip through a wall when they're out of sight. But if we follow along this path, we can see that it opens up into a larger room in the middle, and there's a staircase hallway connected to it. This unused path winds up dead-ending underneath the floor of the next major room. We have no idea what the intention originally was, but I'd like to think that what they had in mind was an opening in the floor of the next room that looked something like this. Then you would have been able to just walk down there and perhaps find a few items to collect. It makes me wish the remake put this back into the game, especially since they added a few new items and armor sets. I find myself thinking that it would have been neat to find some of that stuff down here, perhaps as a world tendency unlock. Here we see our first fire lizard, which I've always called flame geckos, but I'm just realizing now that no one else calls them that. This is something else where I'm mostly okay with the design changes, just because of how simple the original was. It's probably the simplest enemy model in the entire game, with the fire effect on top doing its best to distract you from that. The remake adds some claws to the end of their digits. They changed the eyes once again, this time replacing the vertical slit with a round pupil that's surrounded by some kind of crackly flame effect, perhaps. I'm not sure if Bluepoint has something against those vertical slits for reptile eyes, but now I'm starting to wonder. And the biggest change to their anatomy is that they now have this flared structure on their back, creating a valley running down the middle. In the original, their backs were very flat instead. Imagine this was done to create something that could pass for an opening that would explain where the flames are venting from. 
But I think their best and most effective change for the remake was how the flame effect gets snuffed out when they die. In the original, the flame itself goes away, but they remain a bright orange. Instead, you can watch how the brightness and color drains from them in the remake, which is a nice looking visual effect. Looking up from here makes for another great example of how distant scenery was backlit. It provides more contrast, allowing you to see the distant structures better. The building on the right is practically invisible from here in the original, though it is there. Here's a comparison of the interior of the smelting room, or whatever this is. A couple of the lizards have been rotated to be facing a different direction. There's also a new item corpse on the left side of this room, containing an elixir. The elixir is a new consumable that temporarily buffs stamina regeneration. Basically, they wanted to add some equivalent to the green blossom from Dark Souls. There is a kind of neat environmental effect from the fire lizards we can see here. Any corpses they come into contact with will start burning. This works with both item corpse objects and the actual ragdoll corpses of enemies. And down in the lava pit, there's a small channel added. Though it's not something we can directly interact with, there is more going on behind this design change than just adding random details. Something surprisingly considerate is happening here, and we'll see what they were thinking in a little bit. Mostly everything in this room is identical, but there are a few changes we can find. The shovel in the dirt pile was turned into a breakable object. The workstations were opened up underneath to reveal their heat source. And they also removed a weapon rack here, perhaps to move the weapons up onto the workstation instead. The workstations weren't active in the original, but we can find these corresponding chimneys up on the roof. In the remake, because they're now active, they added smoke coming out of them. I thought that was a nice touch. Though to be fair, they didn't add any smoke to the broken chimney in the middle, which should be venting smoke as well. But they likely didn't want to add a visual obstruction to what the path forward from here is supposed to be, so they probably skipped adding smoke to that one on purpose. Here's another quick comparison of the smelter tower from some new vantage points. I like how it looks a lot in the remake. Adding a set of windows just makes it look nice. It's these sorts of visual embellishments I can get behind. Ones that provide more detail in the environment, but don't go too far, like a lot of the changes to the Boletarian architecture. Though in adding this, they forgot to cover it with collision, so we get to poke the camera inside in photo mode and see some stuff we weren't meant to see. There's nothing too exciting, just some missing textures, because, of course, why would they bother? It's a really small detail, but over here in the original, you can see a hole bored out in the cave wall that allows this structure that carries the water to pass through it. In the remake, it looks like it just clips through the distant wall instead of having a space dedicated to it. Another very rare instance of the remake having less detail for this sort of thing. The height of the railings on this walkway was lowered a lot for the remake. They likely wanted you to have some better visibility of the surrounding environment, like the spinning water wheel off to the right. The remake also added water dropping underneath the pipework carrying the water. Down here, shortly before the second lever that cools the lava pit, we're flanked by more pools of lava that weren't here originally. In the original, it's barely visible because of how dark it is, but there was some out-of-bounds stuff in the dark area. Something similar is also present in the remake. It's barely visible due to the intense bloom of the newly added lava, but we can get a closer look in photo mode.
in the lava pit here, there's a small change to the narrative of why it's here in the first place and how we're cooling it off. Though it's not perfectly level with the base of the smelter room, it is very close to it. The remake added this path from the smelter room I showed earlier, and that leads to a gate that we'll initially find opened by default, but it closes after we pull the lever and the cutscene happens. The original didn't have anything like this. This is probably part of their justification for no longer having a constant stream of water, cooling it off. We did operate the same mechanism to cool this area off with water. That didn't change. It's just that the heat source was also cut off, and so there doesn't need to be a constant waterfall running while you're down here, that the original had. At the end of the day, it's still a very video gamey environment, but it is interesting to see how they made some attempt to deconstruct this logic. I'd be willing to bet that very, very few people have even noticed this, and it's these small, creative changes to the environment that I like the most. If you ever wanted to go down here, I regret to inform you that it just dead ends very quickly, and there's nothing cool to see. The remake usually does a good job of making these sorts of things look like they lead somewhere, but it looks like they didn't extend its length here at all, and it probably dead ends just as quickly. But before we continue through the level, let's open up the shortcut and meet a couple NPCs. Over here, we find another attic space added to this building as well. Down here, we meet Blacksmith Ed. His skin is more covered in scales than Blacksmith Baldwin, which is good environmental storytelling. We can assume that because Baldwin set up shop in the Nexus, he's now further from Stonefang, and whatever is causing everyone to grow scales has slowed down for him, or maybe stopped altogether. The remake does get this detail right between the two blacksmiths, but the effect is still diminished for me in a way that's a little disappointing. The scales are a lot more ambiguous this time around, almost looking more like their skin might be petrifying instead of undergoing a reptilian transformation. And when the miners are lacking a clear parallel to the blacksmiths this time around, that also takes away from it. We should be able to understand that whatever is happening to the miners is also happening to the blacksmiths, and the remake doesn't convey this nearly as well. I do like most of the rest of the embellishments. His hair, or lack of it, was made to be a little bit more distinct from Baldwin compared to the original. Yet a jewelry, like the earrings and necklace, are a nice touch. What was almost the most positive change to his look was equipping the hands of God, but things get really weird here. Though you can find a pair of these in the next level, this is a fist weapon that Ed and Baldwin each drop one of if you kill them. In the remake, they're now shown to each be wearing one, and they're wearing them on opposite hands to really cement that they are the other half of the same pair. But the strange part is that it doesn't look anything like the actual weapon model. I mean, not just compared to the original version of the game, but the remake itself made something that matched the original better, while what the blacksmiths are actually wearing is something completely different. How did this happen? I think this is evidence of some of the artists working for Bluepoint not being on the same page. Whoever was tasked with making the weapon model probably wasn't in communication with those who were working on the character designs. The complete redesign they came up with here is interesting. If we look closely, we can see a red circle that's flanked by a set of horns. This is a representation of the Flame Lurker. Why would Bluepoint want the Flame Lurker to appear on the hands of God? There is speculation that the Flame Lurker is what became of Big M, or that it's some kind of demonic manifestation of what the people here might have revered, a legend who can punch the dragons into submission, trapped in a fiery prison as an obstacle to the Dragon God. If the hands of God were made in worship to someone who could defeat the Dragon God, Maybe putting the flame worker on there makes sense in some way. We can see that it's something that Bluepoint wanted to stress as something the blacksmiths revered, which tracks because they're all about punching too. 
In concept art for the remake, we can find other experiments in incorporating the Flame Lurker into their design. Here it shows up as a tattoo or headpiece of some kind. The link between the blacksmiths and Flame Lurker doesn't stop there. The concept art notes that one of the lenses from the glasses is missing. When Bluepoint redesigned the Flame Lurker, they said that adding back in the missing so-called eye patch was a good choice, because it thematically tied things back to the blacksmiths not seen out of one of their eyes as well. We went back, we looked at it more closely, and we decided, yes, it, the best thing to do is put the patch back on the eye. So we put the patch back on the eye and brought it more in line with what the original was, which in the end, I think was a great decision to put the patch back on the eye. It helped tell us the story a little bit better. You know, it, it also ties in closer with the blacksmith, you know, that's also in Stone Fang. And so in the end, that was the right decision. But at that point was the kicking off moment of, now, does this connection even make sense? It's a bit of a stretch for me, but since that was going through the heads of the people making the remake, it's worth pointing out. I guess punchy guys with bad vision is a stonefang thing. It's difficult for me to critique the new voice acting, at least in a way where we can compare it to the original. Hmm. I haven't seen you around these parts. Bah. What does it matter? You need a blacksmith, show me some coin. If not, head straight for the door. Uh, I haven't seen you around these parts. Ah, uh, what does it matter? You need a blacksmith? Show me your steel. If not, head straight for the door. I completely understand that there will be those who prefer the original, but the same voice actor originally did the voice for both blacksmiths, and he didn't give them a distinguishing tone. They sounded like the same person. For the remake, they rehired the same voice actor for Baldwin, but they recast a new actor for Ed. This is why I don't see much value in a direct comparison between the two. The more pertinent question is whether or not it makes sense for them to sound like the same person in the first place. The remake decided to individualize them, and I can see arguments for and against doing this. Let's move on to the filthy man. His voice comes out feeling a bit smoother and lighter in tone, but when the gruff comes out, it can be reminiscent of the original. Have you heard about that sparkling lizard? He's not easy to catch, but he's got some fine stones, and I know where his nest is. Have you heard about sparkling lizards? Not easy to catch, but they've got some fine stones, and I know where one of their nests is. The original has the same voice actor as Patches, and though he did a good job at making them feel like distinct characters, his method of doing so was giving the filthy man a deeper voice. You see that pit? It's filled with treasure. Oh, I'm sorry. I can't give it away. <laughs> Since giving him a deeper voice in the original is likely the result of Patch's voice actor trying to make it sound more distinct, I can see how the remake might have not felt as compelled to bother when casting a new actor. But I like when restrictions influence the artistic output of a given work. So even if him having a lower voice was something more like an artifact, rather than the developer's original intent, I feel like that should just become part of his character. Anyways, that's just a very minor nitpick. The new voice acting also manages to sound a little less sinister to me. As far as the model goes, I think they did a very good job with this character. They kept things pretty faithful, his shirt being a dirty off-white, and his shorts being a light blue didn't get changed for the remake. They also kept the bandage situation the same, covering his entire right forearm and just a smaller bandage on his left arm. His ribs are visible in both versions, and though the original had more visible scars on the skin, they ramped up the dirtiness and some other imperfections. They kept the cataract in his left eye, really the biggest difference is in his hair. The remake gives him a beard, and the hair on his head is more scraggly. I support these changes. The original is unfortunately Gene Simmons-like in a weird way to me, and I'm okay with losing that. Let's continue on. Things here open up on the left, which adds some distant scenery. There's also now some pools of lava nearby. Here's a small change I found kind of interesting. The staircase in the remake appears to be a little steeper, as it manages to reach the ground level sooner. 
As a result, there's more of a level walkway as you approach this room, allowing you to get a better view of the enemy and the explosive barrels sooner. As we exit this room and head up the path, we'll find another environmental trap that wasn't well defined. There's a miner up ahead who'll throw a rock down at us, and while I'm sure many of you have been hit by this at some point before, I'd like to issue you a challenge the next time you fire up Demon Souls. Try to get hit by this on purpose. It's probably way harder than you're expecting. This is because its implementation is very poorly implemented. The miner has no idea how to target you, which wouldn't be a problem if the trigger was a small area, but it's not. The trigger begins all the way back here, and they really just guesstimated how long it would take you to reach him after passing this spot. It's a fixed amount of time regardless of what you do after you cross this boundary, so you can just chill back here and not worry about it. The remake doesn't appear to have touched this trigger, so we see the exact same issue here. And over here, we find once again more evidence that a lot of stuff regarding draw groups was handled the same as the original. This water wheel disappears from view up here as we cross this boundary. And the same is true in the remake, though it's a lot harder to see with all the extra stuff in front of us. In the original, the shortcut path back to the blacksmith isn't properly rendered from here either, giving more of an open view into the start of the level than we should really have. The same might also be true for the remake. It's hard to tell, but it really looks like it. Here we finally are at the first boss of Stonefang, the Armor Spider. They didn't mess with its design too much. We can spot some broader changes, like how there's more of an orange glow surrounding it, and it comes out less silver looking than the original did. The remake emphasizes an armor-like texture on their exoskeleton more clearly than the PS3 model conveyed. We can see how in the remake, its underside appears exposed, with hairs now sticking out, compared to the original, where there's less distinction between armored and unarmored parts, if any. And in the bottom right here, we can see how its horns, or whatever you call them, were raised up and re-angled a bit for the remake. Just like the Vanguard Demon, the original Armor Spider is another recycled asset, this one having previously appeared in From Software's Ninja Blade. Though that basically came out at almost the exact same time as Demon Souls, having only released only one week prior to it. It's interesting seeing it in this different context. Its implementation in Ninja Blade is a lot more involved and cinematic. Thens informed me that there are some vestigial remnants of an event where the Armor Spider's legs could be cut off in the Code of Demon Souls, though apparently it's so incomplete that it might be too difficult to mod back in. However, we can see how that was a thing for Arachne in Ninja Blade, so that's where that probably comes from. Like most enemies, the magic and fire defense was increased for the Armor Spider. However, the change to the fire defense is a lot more significant than most other cases, increasing from 179 to 279. They probably figured a boss that spits fire shouldn't be too prone to it, so this is a rare example of the remake making a more significant change to strategy. Fire attacks are distinctly less effective here. In this test using fire bombs, the damage was nearly halved. Speaking of fire attacks, one of the coolest visual changes is how they redid the Armor Spider's flamethrower attack. In the original, it would charge up for a bit and then let out a lengthy flame attack that envelops most of the room. In the remake, they took the opportunity to change it so that instead of charging up, it uses that time to flood the room with oil, and then lights it on fire. It doesn't really affect the strategy, and if anything, it's better at communicating where it's safe to stand. Though the flip side to this is that it feels a little less intuitive that you can block it with a shield, so I suppose there's a bit of a trade-off there, but it just looks really neat. The Armor Spider did also have some changes made to its attack parameters, but we're not 100% sure what that actually means. I'll throw up a list of all the changes on the screen, but basically, anything labeled Poly 1 had its value swapped with whatever Poly 2 was. Perhaps the directionality of some attacks were a bit inverted from what they were supposed to be? If we learn more about what this was even addressing, I'll be sure to mention it in a pinned comment below. Let's talk about the music. The remake version is so different that it's basically a different track entirely. 
We can find some surviving elements, but once again it feels like we have to dig for them. The most obvious surviving melody is this recurring motif from the original. Here I'm playing along on a virtual piano to help visualize it. This shows up again in the remake. Although the original starts off with it, here it takes a minute to get there. It also adds some variation, where instead of just looping that one motif, it alternates dropping it down a note. The overall arrangement is very different, of course. In the remake, it first presents this motif in a sort of breakdown where the beat drops out, instead of being accompanied by a drum beat. The notes also have a much longer sustain in the remake, making the motif more legato instead of staccato. They also seemed inclined to add more horror tropes to the remake. Not that the original didn't already do some of that. It does have those dissonant, sustaining strings underneath the motif, but it also got a bit goofy and almost jazzy at times, and it just has a pretty different tone overall. The remake emphasizes a horror element instead, doing that sort of <coughs> string sound that's uh, reminiscent of Psycho. In the introduction of the track, it also does that sort of cliché effect that's typical of what you'd expect for a spider. I'm not sure if there's an official name for this technique. It's the chaotic plucking of strings, which I've once heard described as pizzicato jitters. So let's listen to the first main section of the remake. This doesn't exist at all in the original. It sounds like it was written completely from scratch, and it essentially was, but I do think I've spotted a very tenuous connection to the original. That had a syncopated rhythm on concert toms, which looks like this. This tom part is completely missing from the remake, but what is this new section if not a bunch of syncopated rhythms? Even though the rhythm is not the same, I'm convinced the drum part was heavily reinterpreted to spawn this completely new melody for the strings. But they also created a new motif that wasn't originally there, which once again gets us pretty far from the original. In the original, you can see that it's a four-measure drum pattern that ends with the rhythm for E and. And this forty and isn't something that's particularly stressed, but the composer seemed to latch onto that idea pretty heavily, and doubles it up by stressing a three e and preceding it. And they loop this in a two measure pattern instead of a four measure pattern, meaning every other measure we end up with a strong da 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 sort of rhythm. Again, it feels very tenuous, but I am convinced that this one little on the tom turned into the It's so heavily reconceptualized that I wouldn't even call it a rearrangement. It's a new track that takes some loose inspiration from the original. The original theme was hardly my favorite track from Demon Souls, and I can see why it would sound a bit clunky and weird to world-class musicians. But I think this general reluctance to recognize and embrace the original soundtrack for what it was is something that really hurts the Demon Souls remake. Its unique personality was cast aside. With the boss cleared out, we can observe the arena a bit more carefully. I like how some walls were opened up and allow for this greenish light source to pour in. They also changed the ground so that instead of being solid, we have a lava pit far below that's covered up with a wooden floor. How much does the addition of this pit make sense? Well, I'd say it works very well, and it certainly doesn't disagree with or clash with the rest of the map in any way. Taking a look in the map viewer, there's nothing directly underneath the Armor Spider's boss room, but what it is nearest to is this lava area. And while you're down there in the remake, 
They added some openings to that cave wall that hint at more of a lava scape that's out of view but in that general direction. So yeah. Not only does the original map design accommodate this change just fine, but the remake itself has some internal consistency by adding a couple changes that suggest there should be some cavernous openings with more lava back there. Nearby and out of bounds in the original, there's a cut, unused hallway that's off to the left side of the Armor Spider's boss room. We can see what it looks like in the map viewer, but it's missing an accompanying map piece, so it's not visible or rendered at all. There's nothing to actually see back here with Freecam. But it does have intact collision data, so if you could get there with a bit of cheating, you can still walk through it. We don't have any evidence for what the intended purpose of this hallway was, but given how there's a dead-end path nearby before the boss room with an item at the end of it, I feel like this was probably just an iteration of the same idea. Or maybe like the spiderwebs blocking it would clear with different world tendency. Who knows? Let's continue on to 2-2. While sub-areas weren't named in the original, and simply told you the corresponding boss to the nearest archstone, the remake added new names for each area. However, the name of Tunnel City for 2-2 is one that carries over nicely from the original, since it was named in the area's description. Just like the Armor Spider's boss room, there's a few more openings put into the nearby walls here. Though a couple of the openings in the wall here were in the original as well, like this spot here, and this one over here. This one gets the remake into some trouble because it's another spot I found where we can get the camera out of bounds in photo mode. But of course I'm in the group of people who appreciates this. It allows us to see the newly added lava pit below the Armor Spider room more clearly. The next room with the Fat Official had a light shaft added that wasn't originally there, and we're able to see the exterior of it from here as well. There's two ways we can go from here. Let's go right towards the interior drop-down path first. This first miner here seems to have an easier time seeing you on the opposite side of this object in the remake. And here's today's word of the day. These discarded husks of the rockworms and bear bugs are apparently called exuvii. I always liked how you encounter these before the actual enemies. To add some dynamic details to the environment, chains were added to the ceiling, and in the next room there's a dangling rope you can bump into as well. In this next room, a beam above was removed, and the connecting structure is more visibly in disrepair. This makes sense to me, because the implication is that there used to be a functioning elevator that took you down to Skurver's Nook, but the excavation project here was abandoned after caving in, which is why it's a fairly short dead end. This would also explain why the elevator wasn't maintained. And I can appreciate how the remake took the time to mess this elevator up some more, to make it feel less like a copy and paste of the other elevator set pieces. Some of the drop down paths were modified to be a little less annoying in the remake. Here's a spot where it's easy to get caught on some weird collision, and you can see how that's not a problem in the remake. When we walk between these two beams, we can see how this puts us closer to the edge of the platform below in the original. It also appears that the platform itself is a bit wider here, making the landing a little bit safer. Most notably, there's also this soul item down here which was very annoying to get in the original. If you walked straight off, or even just slightly too far to the left, you'd be pushed pretty far aside in a way that wasn't visually intuitive and missed the drop. It was horribly janky, but this was also cleaned up for the remake. While this is nice to see, the vertical downwards platforming of classic Souls games is still pretty much as awkward as it's always been, so it's still very easy to die here. I even found a couple spots that are worse in the remake, which sort of balances things out, unfortunately. In this outdoor section, it's possible to fall too far to the left here, when that wasn't possible in the original. And hugging this wall to your right and sprinting forward is perfectly safe in the original, while that can get you killed here. One difference worth noting is that the speed at which you fall has been increased a little bit. The difference isn't huge, but it felt glacially slow in the original, especially when coming back from later Souls games. The remake manages to make it feel a little less weird. Let's meet Skurver the Wanderer. He's an NPC who shows up here with pure white world tendency, and also has a hostile black phantom with pure black world tendency. 
I don't mind the changes to his face. The original just feels rushed, and I've heard him referred to as the ugliest Souls NPC, so I feel kind of bad for him. The original doesn't convey the mysterious nature of the character we saw in the loading screen whatsoever, so this is one place where discarding the original look is completely fair game. The only issue I have is that the actual in-game model and the loading screen both seem to agree that his hair was white, while the remake goes for blonde instead. He comes out looking a lot younger than I think he should, especially when we consider that he's one of the named legends in the introduction. Making him look young just doesn't feel like the right fit to me. And the voice acting is completely different this time around, which is actually pretty remarkable since they rehired the exact same voice actor, so it's possible that different direction might be the cause of this. In the original, he had a stutter, and a very different inflection. He got! Oh, oh, you nearly frightened me to death, creeping up on me like that. <laughs> My name is Skurva. I s s seek treasures of the unknown. Oh, he got! You nearly frightened me to death, creeping up on me like that. Oh. My name is Skurva. I seek treasures of the unknown. The voice acting in the remake sounds more ambiguous, like you're not sure if you can trust the guy. I would search for it myself, but I I'm afraid I'd fare poorly against the demons. If you happen to come upon the sword, please let me have a look at it. I would search for it myself, but I'm afraid I'd fare poorly against the demons. If you happen to come upon the sword, please let me have a look at it. But the key difference between Skurver, and another character we'll meet later on named Satsuki, is that Skurver is sincere and without ulterior motives. He just genuinely wants to see the Dragonbone Smasher, and he'll thank you for it. Sure, he has a hostile form and pure black tendency, but he's not evil and he doesn't try killing you just for having the thing he's interested in. So in this regard, the original voice acting captures the motives and personality of Skurver a lot better. Moving on, we'll find our way back at the bottom through the other route as well, so let's go back to the forking path. Something I didn't mention earlier is that the fat officials had another new item added to their drop table, the gold coin. It's a consumable that temporarily boosts luck, but being relatively rare itself, and having only a marginal effect on drop rates, I can't imagine anyone is really using these to help with farming anything. Instead, its most important use to the community is a glitch that's absolutely game-breaking and makes you incredibly overpowered. While the glitch has been patched, if you have a physical copy of the game, you can do some downpatching to pull it off. I'll link to a video by Ashen1 if you'd like to know more. Here's a small new detail with the elevators. The remake allows us to see them being powered by water. The original did include the water tank at the base of the wheel, you just didn't see any water drip as the wheel spins. Let's take the elevator down to the crystal lizard's nest. As we descend, we'll find a couple crystal lizards that are scripted to run towards their group, rather than away from you. They also don't disappear as quickly as other crystal lizards, they'll make it all the way to the pit, which is kind of a nasty trap in a way because chasing them down can cause you to frighten off a whole bunch of lizards at once. We'll get back to the lizards in a second, but along the way we'll encounter a couple Black Phantom NPCs, making the Crystal Lizard chase all the more frantic. Here's a quick comparison of these characters. And here we'll get the Black Eye Stone. It's the item that allows you to invade other players, and it's a guaranteed drop from whichever Black Phantom NPC you kill first. That's from any Black Phantom throughout the entire game, so you might get it in a different level entirely. All of the multiplayer level ranges are identical, aside from the Black Eye Stones, which was made to be a little more generous and have a slightly expanded range in the remake. If you'd like to know more, I'll link to a video I made detailing how the level ranges work. There is not too much that's different about the Crystal Lizard Pit. Once again, the lighting sources are changed a bit by adding a light shaft. One of the torches got moved up here as well. But the most striking difference is the bluish glow that was given to the crystals down here, which looks great in the remake. The original didn't have them at all, just the ground itself had a bit of a greenish glow on its own instead. I find it interesting how a narrow crevice was added to this wall. I don't think the crystal lizards need an explanation of where they run off to, since they just literally disappear right in front of us but there's still something kind of neat about making a subtle change to the environment to maybe suggest where they crawled out from. 
Though I did an up close comparison of their models in the previous episode, there was a very important change to their spawning mechanics I haven't discussed yet, which makes farming them a lot more forgiving in the remake. If you've only played later Souls games, you might not be aware of this, but chasing down a crystal lizard was far more stressful in Demon Souls. If they get away from you and disappear, they permanently despawn. Now, they did thankfully have a counter system, where every time you beat a boss in the corresponding world, it add plus one to every spawn location, meaning you can go back and get a second or third crystal lizard in the same spot. But you were guaranteed those extra copies with defeating bosses. It's not like they're a redo for having let any get away. Missing any single one of them meant losing out on more upgrade materials you could have had otherwise. When you combine this with the fact that there's no other way to obtain certain upgrade materials, this meant that the crystal lizards were your only chance of getting the items needed to fully upgrade your weapons down certain paths. To add more salt to this wound, the max upgrade items weren't even guaranteed drops. There was RNG involved, so you had to get lucky with certain crystal lizards on top of all of that. This is all to say that permanently losing any crystal lizards was uniquely stressful, and a much bigger nightmare than it ever was in Dark Souls. I think the remake did a good job of responding to this. Instead of completely upending Demon Souls' crystal lizard mechanics, they kept the original system mostly intact, but with one key difference. The crystal lizards only permanently despawn if you hurt them. If you don't touch one at all and it disappears, you'll get to keep trying over and over. I think this is a good middle ground for keeping the same overall system, but making it a lot less frustrating. There's also one other helpful change regarding their drop rates. Most of their drop rates are identical to the original, but certain crystal lizards had their rare items drop rates increased. For example, this crystal lizard inside the Dragon Gods arena had its base drop rate for the pure clear stone doubled. Doubling the base value doesn't mean the actual drop rate is exactly doubled, but it's still a significant improvement. I'll throw some examples up on the screen, and you can pause the video if you'd like a better look. Let's turn around at the elevator and head down this path. I've always liked this room with the explosive fireballs that are swirling about. It looks cool. But I have to admit, the purpose of this has always gone over my head. Maybe they did it just because it makes for a unique set piece, because it's not really a functional trap. They are above a bottomless pit you can fall into and die, but since you've been taught to keep your distance from them, they actually help prevent you from falling in. Aside from one further down the hallway that's separate from these, they don't ever get close enough to be a threat to you either. Though they are technically functional. If we disable gravity and head over to them, we can finally get them to explode. So if it's not here as an obstacle, since it goes out of its way to telegraph itself and we can easily walk around it, perhaps there's some environmental storytelling happening? Or at the least, if we wanted to come up with some kind of explanation, what are our options? What even are these things? Earlier in the level, we ran into a few minecarts that were rigged with these explosives. Right around the corner from those minecarts, we found a fat official, so it's implied he's responsible for sending them our way. And the fat officials are capable of casting fire spells, so I used to think that this was meant to convey a unique spell of theirs we don't get to see them cast in combat. Basically, I imagine that they're just casting something like Lingering Flame from Dark Souls 2. But I think this disagrees with that. Why would the fat officials set explosive traps over some random bottomless pit? And if this is something they're capable of, why wouldn't they set the same kind of traps in Boletaria? I think it's because, whatever these are, they're probably natural to the environment of Stonefang. Perhaps it's like a faceless equivalent to the Wisps from Dark Souls. Or it's just some kind of spirit orb like the Bobble from Black Cauldron. But if the Bobble was also a bomb. But whatever it is, it seems to be emanating from the environment. And here we find what could be a natural cluster of them, having floated up from the pit. Explosive materials are crucial to mining, and the miners are presumably people who've been at this for a long time. The miners have probably learned how to harness these things. In the real world, while explosives and mining apparently date back to the 17th century, it didn't really take off in a major way until the advent of TNT, which was a late 19th century technology. Of course, the world of Demon's Souls is complete fantasy, so it doesn't require more modern technology to justify anything we find. And firebombs exist in this world, so some might argue that some TNT equivalent is probably available in the universe of Demon's Souls. But, those firebombs are described as an oil pot with a flammable cloth plug. That's a more medieval solution. Given the medieval aesthetic of Demon's Souls, the idea of there being a natural source of explosives in Stonefang 
like these wisps and also the exploding bear bugs, it makes for an alluring explanation for why a pre-industrial civilization could have developed industrial-scale mining operations. One difference in this hallway is that minecart tracks are now running through them. And in this corner, the original intent was that this probably conveyed a collapsed path that continued in this direction, but with the simple wall texture, it might not necessarily read that way to the player. The remake makes that a lot more clear. Okay, so let's go all the way back up to the fat official, as if we never took the elevator down. Minecart tracks were added into this corridor as well, which makes sense, since we find this right outside. It implies they should have been there. Now that we've reached the exterior, we can do another comparison of a vista that's changed quite a bit. We'll see some newer openings in the distant wall, and the extent to which this changes our view will become a lot more apparent when we take a look below in a second. I keep referring to this area as the exterior, or outside, drop-down path, which helps distinguish it from the shaft by Skurver. But that might be something of a misnomer, because this isn't actually outside either. This is a large, cavernous area. If you look up, you'll find that it's completely contained with a ceiling. I think there might be something of a reverse Blighttown effect here, where in Dark Souls 1, a lot of players think of Blighttown as an underground area, not realizing that it has open sky above it. Here we find the opposite. It feels like we've stepped outside, but we're still actually underground. If you remember how dropped items over here were visible back at the beginning, which is well above ground, this is another reason we can't take the spatial accuracy of the Stonefang map too literally. We just have to imagine that we've traveled much further underground than we really have compared to 2-1. The remake maintains this as what appears to be a mostly enclosed space, but adds some light shafts in the distance to put some openings in the cave ceiling. Expanding the map in this direction doesn't create any new issues with the rest of the level's design. This view is pointing away from the rest of the level, so this doesn't conflict with anything. With the view extended much further in this direction, the lava scape below becomes much larger. More distant cranes and minecart tracks are scattered throughout this new environment. In the original, the one detail we find along the solid wall of rock is some occasional sets of tube worms. We find these as breakable objects later in the level, but here they exist as 2D textures. Let's do a couple more enemy comparisons. The rockworms had a few changes, but none that are probably too obvious to players going by memory. The five flaps that open up around the orifice have these additional spikes on the reverse side in the remake. The orifice itself is more pronounced in the original, in that it's like a tube that sticks out further. The mouth in the original has layers of teeth going down into it, sort of like the Chaos Eaters of Dark Souls, while the remake doesn't have as much depth to how the teeth are arranged. Instead, it adds eight bigger teeth to the outside. One small detail that was maintained is that if you look closely at where the body segments meet, you'll see a bit of pink-colored flesh between the armored segments. If we take a look at where the rockworm pokes out of the ground, the original didn't do as good of a job at blending it into the environment, where the dirt is a different color. To be perfectly fair, upturned soil can be a different color, though it appears the remake attempted to correct this. But if we look closely, we can see some really stretched textures that don't look so great. I don't think anyone will notice this without photo mode, so it's absolutely not a big deal, but I still thought it was interesting to see, as it might be the lowest quality part of any enemy in the remake in terms of graphical fidelity. The rockworms did have a change to their bullet parameters, where the effect of gravity on one of the lava attacks should be more significant in the remake. Basically, the downwards velocity should be higher, traveling at 2 meters per second instead of 1. This change can't be determined visually, however, because the lava we see isn't directly tied to the actual bullet hitbox, which is invisible. So the thing that actually causes damage here can't be seen at all, meaning that hypothetically, the only way to know there's a difference would be that standing underneath it should mean that we'll take damage faster? But like, it spews out from right over our head and will basically hit us instantly in the original anyways, so whatever they're doing here was a very subtle tweak. I can't notice any kind of impact on the gameplay, to be honest. Here's another change with this attack. In the remake, this also lacks a lingering visual effect, where it previously appeared to splash around on the ground. I find it a bit funny, because it's like the original does a better job of having this attack interact with the environment. Visually, at least. But I also understand wanting to get rid of it, 
because the lingering splash of lava doesn't actually hurt you in the original. It makes it look like you don't have an opening here to run through when you really do. So the remake probably removed that lava splash intentionally, to give you a clear visual on when it's safe to pass through. I also spotted something that appears to have broken. Most, but not all, rockworms are capable of a grab attack. I wanted to compare the animation in the remake to see if how the player is thrown was handled any differently, but I don't think it works anymore. The rockworm will just pass right through you, and you won't take any damage. As far as we can tell, all of the relevant enemy parameters should be the same, so we're not sure what's causing this. Next up, we have the bear bugs. I have to admit, I've always had a hard time remembering their exact name. Is it bear bug, or is it bug bear? The reason I get confused is because the bug bear is actually a much more popular name when it comes to fantasy creatures. Though its history goes back much further, the modern conception of a bug bear is largely driven by Dungeons and & Dragons and similar role-playing games, where you could basically describe it as if you took an orc or goblin, but turned it into a furry. That's obviously not what this is. This is the bear bug. Why are they named so similarly to a monster that's more well-known than them? I wondered previously if they were just doing the Final Fantasy or Castlevania thing, where sometimes random mythological references are used, but it's a name only and the design doesn't match. But that's not the case here, it's just a coincidence. As I learned from Loki, these are called bear bugs because that's a direct translation of the Japanese term for water bears. And as many of you probably already know, water bear is a colloquial term for the tardigrade. So for the bear bug, all we're really seeing is a similar nickname for the tardigrade that's just slightly different in Japanese. Once we recognize these creatures as oversized tardigrades, that explains their overall design a lot better. It also explains why we find them in this hellish landscape. They're known for being able to survive some extremely harsh conditions, including being exposed to the vacuum of space. Now, they're really not as indestructible as their reputation can hype them up to be, but Demon Souls plays into this by having some that evolve to thrive in lava, which is pretty cool. The redesign gives them a much more crackly texture to their skin, so we lose this organized texture to them that the original had, where there were clear rings or lines that marked these body segments. We can turn the bloom down in photo mode to get a better look at them, but if you do a Google search for Demon Souls Bear Bug, I find it funny that the PS5 version is very visually noisy and it's hard to tell what you're looking at, while the simpler design of the PS3 version is much more comprehensible as a tardigrade monster. Their feet also got simplified for the remake. They got turned into these larger, single blocks, while the original had individual toes or digits visible. Once again, something that's more recognizable as a tardigrade. I really love this fan art by Sebastian Ermer. I'll link to it in the video description below. While his take was perhaps a bit more cozy than the aesthetic that would be needed in-game, I think it looks great, and in my opinion, it's much closer to how it should have looked for the remake. I'm fully aware I'm nitpicking here, I should stress that the redesigned bear bugs don't bother me nearly as much as the fat officials or miners. This barely registers as an issue for me, but at the same time, I do think I would have preferred a more strict recreation. To say something positive, the newly added flames and particle effects look great, and pair really well with their new design. To see them in motion does the newer model a lot more justice than a Google image search. Here's an obscure change that not a lot of players might realize but the flying bear bugs had the size of their collision hitbox increased, and the change is surprisingly dramatic. In the original, you can easily run around these two, but they'll trap you here in the remake. This difference was achieved by changing their push collision hitbox from matching their ragdoll into a fixed radius of one meter. When we compare the two side by side, I think this raises the question of why would a modern game prefer to have a larger, less accurate sphere for collision? Now, this does make some sense to me. However their collision was set in the original, it didn't match the visuals of their body well at all. You could walk right into them and clip inside them. Giving them a larger spherical radius was certainly Bluepoint's way of addressing this. But with how hard it is to run around these two and how that looks a bit funny, I wonder if trimming the size of that radius down a little bit would have made for something better than either version. Here's the other funny part. The small, non-flying bear bugs have this exact same issue, but they didn't bother doing anything for them in the remake you can still clip right into them. Gameplay-wise, this is probably for the best. I imagine they didn't bother, because getting stuck on them here in a way that you didn't in the original would have been a lot more obvious and annoying compared to just the two flying ones below. But I still have to wonder if there wasn't a better middle ground. The bear bugs also had a new item added to their drop tables, the bear bug grains. This is a consumable that increases fire resistance. It has a drop rate of 5.6% at base luck and world tendency. I should stress that this new drop doesn't affect their drop rate of the Dragonstone Shards and Chunks. 
This was added as a secondary drop event, and both are run every time a bear bug dies. This means the bear bug can drop both at the same time. They are completely independent of each other. Regarding changes not made, I'm a bit surprised that the giant bear bugs didn't have their stats changed at all. I get the idea that they're supposed to be these tanks that take a lot of effort to kill, but because of how tedious that can be, I don't think anyone would have faulted the remake if they took like 10 or 15% off of their HP, but that doesn't appear to have happened. Let's continue on. Here's Patches. I'm gonna skip him for now, but I'd like to quickly mention that the first time you encounter Patches here, he has this animation of waving to the player to try and get your attention. He stops doing it once you get close enough, and it's a one-time thing, but it's neat seeing an NPC use one of the player gestures. Down here is where we find the Dark Heater Shield, but this entire upgrade path was renamed to Shade in the remake. I do appreciate how the massive gaps in a few of these walkways have been filled in. There's solid collision here, so you can't actually fall through them in the original, and that's communicated better in the remake. When you do see a bigger gap in the remake, you actually have to be careful. There's not too much to say about the tunnel area. For some visual diversity, the remake added some sections where the walls glow a little bit. Otherwise, it's pretty faithful with object placement and environmental markers. Thankfully, some objects have improved collision, so some things that really shouldn't have been an obstacle previously are less annoying now. By the way, if you're someone who has trouble navigating these tunnels and you just want to get straight to the boss from here, I finally discovered a good visual aid and I'm not sure if it's common knowledge or not. Just follow the torches. Any path you find with a torch nearby will lead you straight to the boss, and this works in both the original and the remake. Admittedly, the strategy sort of falls short at this last intersection, because the nearest torch here marks a dead end with a bear bug and some crystal lizards, but it's a very short path that's obviously a dead end, so it's not going to get you lost. From that same intersection, there's only two other ways to go, and one of them has a torch leading to the boss. Down here in the lava area, the giant dragon bones found in the environment are rearranged and are overall more visible in the remake. They were present here in the original, but being higher up, they were pretty much impossible to see through all of the fumes. Here's a better look in the map viewer. The items in their placement in the lava remains unchanged, though a new item corpse carrying the Burrowers set is found along the bank of the lava. This is a completely new set of armor made for the remake, though it lacks a headpiece. Armor of the Burrowers, Ancient Ancestors of the Excavators in their chronicles, the burrowers unearthed the remains of many dragon bones. In awe, they constructed a temple to worship and imprison what they believed to be a dragon god. The armor is clearly meant to convey the clothes of people who would be related to the blacksmiths. And the high fire defense, though obviously helpful for the upcoming boss, I feel like was dropped right here to make running into the lava for the items out here a little less scary. Other item corpses in the lava were replaced with models that are appropriately charred in the remake. And this tube worm object has been updated to have more accurate collision, where each individual piece breaks separately. While this is nice for improved realism, the bear bugs often get stuck on these things in annoying places out in the lava. So in the remake, I've found that trying to clear a path for them using arrows is significantly more work. Before we make our way to the boss, I wanted to quickly mention that the rock worms protecting the hands of God are a bit different from the rest. They only have one attack. It's a different lava attack that shoots straight up, and they also only do this attack and nothing else. Here we finally are at the Flame Lurker. The overall length of the entire cutscene remains identical, but there's a few small changes within. We'll notice some shots change at different times, but certain key moments, like the hands pushing through here, remain in sync. In the remake, the Flame Lurker's dismount from above is a bit different, where he doesn't jump onto the ceiling first. But with the ceiling jump taken away, they did add a ground pound with its fists, and the cutscene sort of resyncs with its roar here. This is the most notable example of the remake having a struggle with the design. There was a lot of backlash over its appearance in the announcement trailer, where a few character details were completely missing. The general concern from fans was that it was replaced with something more generic. So Bluepoint responded by adding some of these details back in before the release. 
But if we listen to Bluepoint's reaction from the Noclip documentary, I think it's something worth calling out because I think it illustrates a recurring philosophy that steers them in the wrong direction sometimes. You know, it's a it's a difficult thing because at the same time, like you take the flame lurker and you take the model and you look at the original PS3 model and there's there's details there, but there's there's a lot of not details there. And so when you look at it on the PS3, I feel like your eye, you know, naturally makes up. You, you look at something, you see some shading, you see some light, you see some things, and then your eye sort of fills in the details and so on. But when you actually get up to the model, it's just not there. You know, it's, it's like you want to see something better than what it really is. And so when we start working on those models, it's like, well, what are they trying to do here? I don't know. That response of, I don't know, isn't a very good look in my opinion. I get it. We're not going to understand the reasoning behind all of From Software's design choices, and they go on to talk about how the original concept art doesn't match the in-game model of the PS3 version very well either, which is fair to a point. He was quite a bit slimmer in the concept art, but the missing details in question were at least consistent between the concept art and model. We had the eye patch, which was a completely crusted over eye, and melting around the mouth that frames the mouth in a particular way. I understand the argument that in transitioning from PS3 assets to something modern, that you're going to imagine a lot of details that aren't really there from the simpler models and textures, so there needs to be some flexibility in doing a redesign. You're going to have to make some executive decisions and just add or change some stuff that wasn't there originally. But I think they're in the wrong to talk about the Flame Lurker as an example of where it made sense to do what they did, because they're talking about the PS3 version like it's so simplistic that they were encouraged to come up with something else. In certain cases, yes, I completely understand looking at stuff like these fringy bits and the texture of the skin, and trying to figure out how to adapt that understandably leads to doing something a bit different. Like, is that just a really low-res version of flames meant to be on his body, that are kind of supposed to blend with the VFX? If that's the case, discarding weird elements like that makes perfect sense. But more generally speaking, it's not that the details were actually missing in the original. They were there. What seems most likely, in my opinion, is that they chose to ignore those details because they found them weird. Part of me gets it. If you look at the original model in a model viewer without the flame effects, it's a really strange character design. Out of context, it's not as menacing as it could be. He's a total weirdo. I think the intention was to make him less goofy, so they purposefully cut the details they found awkward, making the argument that there weren't enough details in the original ring a bit hollow. I think they just kind of danced around admitting that they simply didn't like it, and they trusted themselves to make something that looked tougher and more menacing. There's another detail that didn't survive either of their new iterations, which are these growths on the back. If we really wanted to nitpick, we could point out how there's also stuff like these pads on the bottom of his feet. There's a bunch of details that the original offered, so framing the problem as a lack of detail just doesn't work for me. I'm not convinced by that explanation. In the end, after responding to fan backlash, the final model of the Flame Lurker isn't so bad. Adding the encrusted eye and melting face brought things back in the right direction. They also made some good choices in doing so. The remake shows a bit of exposed skull in the cheekbones. This is a detail not present in the original. That, to me, is an example of adding new detail that makes sense with the original intention. If the idea was that his face just kind of melted off and hardened in a new form, what we see under the chin in the original is just kind of whatever. In the remake, though, it's like the flesh sloughed off his face and rehardened as an asymmetrical blob down there. That was also a good choice. The face melting is an important aspect of its design. It's the reason the skull is exposed on top. So when we look at the remake's concept art, the exposed skull without the exposed jaw just doesn't work as well, so listening to fan feedback definitely fixed a shortcoming of this design. Taking a look at the arena, there were some pretty big changes to the aesthetic. Adding some big horns here is maybe a bit tacky and unnecessary, but overall I don't mind making things more alien. The outer walls are replaced with these latticed, sort of melted structures. The out-of-bounds area behind them was opened up a bit to reveal a surrounding lava scape. And we also have these melted statues added in. The floor was changed to have a bunch of circular embellishments as well. There were some changes to the environment which affects the gameplay a little bit, but it's mostly minor. Most of the exposed lava on the floor is positioned and proportioned very similarly to the original. But the smaller patches in the remake seem to be easier to walk over without taking damage. It's like the damage area is a little bit more narrow. 
A change was also made to these dragon bones by the fog gate. In the original, they were indestructible and they blocked your movement. You can walk through them now, with the bigger pieces requiring a specific angle of approach to break, uh, so it's a bit awkward, but you can break them. At first I thought this was probably a convenience thing for the player, so you don't get stuck on them. But after seeing the flame lurker get stuck here in the original, I think they actually did this to help the boss instead. Let's compare the music. The original is very repetitive and hypnotic. Apart from occasional eighth notes on the timpani, I really like how simplistic it is rhythmically. There's never anything faster than a quarter note from the melodic voices. Mostly everything is very on the beat, as a quarter note, or half note, or whole note, making it almost completely devoid of any syncopation. I would describe the flow of the music as lumbering or plotting, but not at all in a bad way. It might not convey the energy of a difficult fight, but that's part of the charm of the original soundtrack to me. Tracks like this and the original Storm King sort of have the vibe of something like a Philip Glass composition to me, when he's not doing the fast arpeggiated note stuff. I know I keep talking about the remake soundtrack being more bombastic and not a very great fit stylistically, by the end of the series all that's going to remain of that dead horse will be an amorphous puddle, I get that. But the reason I'm keen on sharing this example is because I think fans of later Souls games might not see the big deal with the remake soundtrack, since they're used to that kind of sound. But if I was the director, and I tasked you with finding music that has the aesthetic of Demon Souls, I can't stress enough how far off the mark epic Dark Souls or Elden Ring music would be. I'd like to make the case that this is a major component of the vibe of Demon Souls. This, in my opinion, is the sort of sound that the remake soundtrack is sorely missing. <laughs> Of course, we can expect the remake to go for something a lot more intense, which if you want something that conveys a more obvious urgency and tension, I can't argue that it's not at least better at doing that. The remake also has this breakdown that's not present in the original at all. It's extremely Bloodborne sounding, and I really like it. Maybe not as a rearrangement to the Flame Lurker, but out of context and on its own, this might be my favorite thing from the new soundtrack. Things do culminate in giving us a melody that's similar to the original, but it's in stark contrast to the understated and mesmerizing vibe that the original has. Let's continue on to the Dragon God. As we make our way into his arena, we'll see that the stylistic change to the environment continues. Here's a more direct comparison of how it looks different. And here's a comparison of the architecture from the outside. Here's our first look at the Dragon God in his proper location. They added a new visual effect, where lava now spills from his mouth when he attacks. And his eyes still change from yellow to red, but the timing of that has changed a bit. Off to the left here, we have the Dragonbone Smasher. This is a path that's normally blocked off unless you have pure white world tendency. This is our second special weapon, the previous being the Demon Brand, which we found in the Boletarian Mausoleum. 
What makes these weapons special? Well, it's the fact that we actually see them in the environment. And unlike other loot, there's a unique animation for picking them up. There's one of these in every world, and I wish this sort of thing was more common in later Souls games. Even though I don't use these weapons very often, it's just fun picking them up. I already showed some side-by-side -side comparisons in the first episode, but here's another look. They tidied up how he's placed into the environment. On the right we can see how his hand actually grabs onto the ground in front of him. And his feet used to sort of float above the lava, but now they're submerged. Here's another look at his hands, which have six fingers. And we can see how the remake maintains the wings being tattered and having holes in them. The most notable change about the anatomy is that the dragon's rock-hard abs are no longer visible. And the horns on his head don't turn into white bone, they're all covered with the same skin texture in the remake. And although we can't get a similar vantage point in the remake, I figured I might as well include a full body shot from the distance, since this is something we can't normally see. His tail is massive. This is something I talked about in my Dark Souls Dissected episode on object health, but we actually have some objects here in the Dragon Gods arena that take multiple hits to break. There aren't any objects like this in Dark Souls 1, and I believe that might be due in part to how the draining of object HP became a lot more inconsistent and sloppier behind the scenes. I'll link to that video with a timestamp if you'd like to hear more about how draining object HP was tighter in Demon Souls, and how it might have been broken in a weird way for most of the rest of the series afterwards. To this day, games like Elden Ring have objects break like they did in Dark Souls 1 instead of Demon's Souls, and there are some strange and obscure ramifications to this. To put it simply, Demon's Souls handled this better. Now, we did lose a small bit of cheese the original used to have. If you found yourself having a hard time clearing these objects without getting killed, which is understandable because the stealth aspect can be a little difficult to parse, you used to be able to force quit on death so your death doesn't register. And though the fight starts over and you'll respawn outside the fog gate, the objects you've broken will remain broken, so it'll be easier getting through the second time. It reminds me a lot of this boss fight from Mega Man 2, where pre-breaking all of these walls and then dying on purpose can make the fight easier. But this doesn't work in the remake. While you can still avoid death by quitting out fast enough, the objects seem to respawn no matter what. Here's a look at the redesigned Ballista. I've never quite understood what the interaction mechanism was meant to be. Is that a person? To me it almost looks like a robed figure, like vaguely religious iconography. That could just be pareidolia though, and I really have no idea what I'm looking at. I think the folks at Bluepoint also had no idea, and just went for this complete redesign, and I don't blame them. The overall length of this cutscene is quite a bit shorter. The Ballista fires faster, the Dragon God retaliates faster, and the path ahead is hinted at without cutting to a new angle for it. Less time is spent lingering on it. Before we trigger this cutscene, our path forward is blocked by this wall. We see it get smashed during the cutscene, along with the ballista, but of course you don't actually get hurt despite standing by the ballista. The remake briefly shows the player standing away from it during the cutscene, despite you never having a chance to really move there, which makes sense. I thought the original didn't bother at all, but I was surprised to learn that it actually had the same solution. It just wasn't framed as well and it's easy to miss. I thought it was a pretty cool fix for the remake to change the camera angle so you can see it more clearly. Here's another look at where the player model gets moved to using Freecam. And let's just skip right on over to the next cutscene. Turning things around from the previous changes, this time the remix cutscene is extended, both to extend the Dragon God's roar, and to spend more time showing off his final weak spot.
down here, we can see that the Dragon God was reposed a little after getting skewered. In the original, his arms clipped through each other pretty badly, and the remake fixes this. Out of all of the enemies in the game, the Dragon God also has what is by far the most significant change to a defense value. Fire defense was increased from 219 to 686, so he's now immune to fire damage, which makes sense to me. It doesn't affect things much due to the puzzle nature of the fight. It's just a tiny bit of polish that only affects attacking his chin, horn, thingy. I don't think anyone is going to complain that fire bombs or fire spells don't hurt him anymore in the remake. I think I've already done enough music comparisons for this episode, so I'm not going to bother with the Dragon God. You can expect the same kinds of changes, and you can always look up the tracks on your own if you're curious. But the one bit of praise I'd like to throw at the remake here is that the Dragon God actually got three different tracks. There are distinct phases before and after every cutscene, and on a conceptual level, I like that a lot. This should be clear after my first episode, but I know a lot of people wonder if this is like the opposite side of the same arena where we meet the Dragon God in the tutorial. So here's some quick comparisons to show that it's definitely not meant to be the same place. And here's how the far end of the Dragon God's arena looks in the remake. Now that we've killed our first Archdemon, the remake throws us a bone with a new feature, Cross Archstone Warping. We can now go to any Archstone without having to visit the Nexus, which is pretty cool. It's a little quaint in the context of getting the Lord Vessel in Dark Souls 1 and suddenly being able to warp, but I feel like Bluepoint was probably inspired by getting a mid-game reward like that, and this is a nice thing to have. Load times are considerably fast in the remake, so popping in and out of the Nexus was already a vastly improved experience compared to the original which makes not having this feature until you get here not a big deal, but once you have it, it's kind of great. Now, even though I started ramping up some harsher criticisms in this episode, and there's definitely more to come, I still stand by what I said in a previous episode. The Demon's Souls remake manages to be more than the sum of its lesser parts. I know there are some people so turned off by the change in art direction that they don't want Bluepoint anywhere near potential future Souls remakes, but I'd just like to be crystal clear that I have absolutely not come to the same conclusion. The idea that From Software would do something like this themselves just doesn't even register as a hypothetical to me. I understand if that sounds preferable to you, but that's not happening. The reality of the situation is that Bluepoint put all this effort into converting the original game into a new engine. What they've learned in this process is, as I see it, the only thing that makes a potential Bloodborne or Dark Souls remake like this possible. The amount of work it would take someone else to do the same thing from scratch almost seems insurmountable to me. While well, Bluepoint already knows the From Software engine inside and out, they already know how to reconstruct these games. While I don't want remakes to come at the expense of remasters and ports, choosing between something like the Demon's Souls remake existing versus not? Yeah, I would rather this exist. Just as the idea of this ever happening for Bloodborne or Dark Souls would also be cool. Would I hope that the folks over at Bluepoint take some of these criticisms to heart? Absolutely. But I would also love to see them get another shot at this. It's far too easy and reductive to show a side-by-side -side comparison of the fat officials and say they suck at this, because there's a lot here that's really good. 
There's a really solid foundation, and it's a shame if it gets overlooked. And for them to not get another chance at this, to me, that'd feel like a waste of what they created. They didn't just make a Demon's Souls remake. They basically have a From Software engine converter ready to go, and that kind of kicks ass. Okay, so that wraps things up for part 3 of the Demon's Souls compare through. I learned my lesson from last time that I can't promise any kind of release schedule moving forward, but I at least hope it's clear that I will be continuing this. These compare through episodes are time consuming projects that easily take up the effort of at least three other videos, and there's still a lot of dissected videos I'd like to be making. It's hard to justify going all in on the series, so the wait between episodes probably will continue to be pretty long. That being said, I'm very happy that I finally got this done, and I'm very much looking forward to returning to Latria in part four, whenever that may be. If you'd like to support this channel, please consider subscribing, liking, or leaving a comment. It really makes a big difference. You can also support me directly on Patreon, where I post updates and share some behind-the-scenes stuff. That's patreon.com slash illusorywall. I'd like to thank King Boar for data mining and helping create a document that compares the parameters of the PS3 and PS5 version, and also Thens DES for additional modding and testing help. I'll link to their socials, as they're people you should probably be following if you're into my videos. I'd also like to thank Consumstra and Adon6 for lending their time in multiplayer so I could have access to unpaused photo mode. And an extra special thanks to all of my backers at the Evil Vagrant tier. Astranicus, Basileus, Daniel Barsh, Diagram Spaghetti, Eric W., Ethan Ross, Europa, Gary Marshall, Hollow Invasion, Hugsized, Kakaruma, Carl Germ, Kiko Abad, Chris, Lazy Tangent, Lude Frago, Liam Arendt, Moonblind Witch, Mystic Referee, Nashwan Azari, Nate Hines, Novocaine, Patrick Conroy, Petrus, Quinn Parsons, Ronax, Stephen Baggett, Stuart Rice, The Majalis Duo, Torin, Zenatu, and Zelther. Thanks again for watching.